Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nigel Howarth, and with my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Denis Tack from Belgium, we would like to welcome you this afternoon to this interactive teaching session, Common and Uncommon Errors in Plain Film and CT Imaging of the Chest, How to Improve Your Performance. We will show you missed lesions this afternoon that have really been missed. We will look at various anatomical areas, clinical entities and pathologies. We will include medical legal cases, and our objectives are to interactively learn about the reasons for missing lesions and to help you reduce your risk of missing further lesions. We will concentrate on the chest X-ray, but we will show you several cases of missed lesions on CT scans. And I'll just remind you, of course, that the chest X-ray is very important for the management of patients with chest diseases and is still one of the most frequent causes of malpractice issues. So this afternoon, we will show you 33 cases with 29 questions. And we've tested these cases on keen fourth-year medical students who score an average of 50%. So you can compare your performance with those of these medical students. Now, just to make sure that everything's working, I turned 50 years old last month. And I'm, I have no embarrassment to try to give you a lesson for those of you who are in the room and are over 50 to how to use a smartphone. I've been to several interactive teaching sessions over the last couple of days here. It doesn't always work. So if you have a smartphone, please use it. Please go onto the ECR Wi-Fi, accept the terms and conditions, and then when that's done, you can choose another Wi-Fi, which is the ECR 2014 Room A. And if you're blocked on Room C or Room F, then you have to change to the other room, Room A. Now, this is supposed to be automatic, but it isn't always automatic. So I hope some of you are connected. And I will ask you then the first question, and this is just for me and Denis and the technician to make sure that we're working together. So, have you come here to make a few phone calls in a quiet room, get some sleep in a dark and quiet room, talk to a colleague you have not seen since the last ECR, or to learn about errors in chest imaging. So if we could have the answers now, please. Well, thank you very much. Okay, the next slide, we don't need the technician to show up the answers. It's not very important. We'll gain a bit of time. Who are these two great men? Laurel and Hardy, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards or the two Jose's. Now, for those of you interested in chest radiology, you probably know the two Jose's. Jose Villar, the man on the right with the sunglasses, is responsible for organizing all these interactive teaching sessions. He introduced them here at ECR. And any complaints about how this session runs, please send them to Professor Jose Villar. Okay, well, what you will see over the next uh, hour and a half, every three or four cases, this yellow right angle will appear. And that's a clue for us to change speaker. So to keep you awake and alive, well, uh, I will now hand over to Denis, and every three or four cases, we will uh, change uh, the speaker. So over to you, Denis, for the first case. Thank you, Nigel. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a privilege to be here and to share the cases with you. So case number one is a 62-year-old woman with dyspnea. And she has a past history of ovarian carcinoma. Here are the frontal and lateral chest radiographs. And I will show you now the question. What would you report? A right pleural effusion? A left pleural effusion? Bilateral, right larger than left? Or bilateral, left larger than right. A few seconds again, the radiographs. Please vote now.
Okay. Could we have the results? Bilateral right larger than left is the major the majority of you. But you missed something. In fact, the left effusion is larger than the right. The right pleural effusion was reported as being larger. A puncture was performed in the emergency room and they got no fluid. So they requested a CT. And on the CT, you can see that the larger fusion is on the left and not on the right. Looking at the radiographs again, in fact, you should look at the aortic arch and the air bubble in the stomach and detect that this is an arrow from the radiographer and the radiograph was inverted. This is the correct radiograph. What happened? A pneumothorax appeared on the right. The patient had to be intubated and stayed for 10 days in the intensive care unit. So, you may think that this kind of error never happens twice. In the same department 10 days later, a 63-year-old man presenting with dyspnea and a past history of laryngeal carcinoma. Here is the radiograph. And we reported a left pleural effusion. However, at bronchoscopy in the ICU, a tumor and a complete obstruction of the right main stem bronchus was observed. At CT, the effusion is on the right. Looking at the radiographs again, it's quite difficult to identify with certainty the right and the left side. Maybe the air in the left flank more likely correspond to the descending and not the ascending colon. Okay, so beware technical conditions. Now we have case three with an uh, an employee, an hospital employee, undergoing a chest radiograph for screening. This is the radiograph. Most of you have seen this abnormality. And the question to you is, what does this opacity represent? Active TB, pneumonia, artifacts, or other. Please vote now. <laughs> Let's have a look. You can still vote. Okay. Both, both of you are right. It's not really an artifact, but it's something else. One hour later, we perform the radiograph again. Here is it. Here is the comparison. And of course, you can recognize this fantastic and beautiful hair braid. Up to Nigel. Okay, thank you, Denis. Okay, um, to save time, please don't clap my colleague every time he leaves the podium, because he's going to do it about 10 times. But it's well-deserved. So, 79-year-old man now, with cough and recurrent pneumonias. He has chronic renal failure, and he's under hemodialysis. Here is his chest x-ray. Here is the question. What is your diagnosis? Bilateral pleural effusions, pleural effusions with right lower lobe consolidation, pleural effusions with bilateral consolidation, more than that, or can't say. So please vote now. So I saw that about 200 of you are connected with your smartphones. That's quite a good number.
Okay, a few more of you are connected. That's very good. Thank you. Let's have the results, please. Okay, more than that. Well, if we were in a smaller room, I would ask those of you who said more than that to tell me what they saw. Um, but we won't do that to save time. And those of you who said more than that, well, you are right. Now, why? Here is the patient's chest X-ray. I will now show you his chest X-ray one month before. And I will show you his chest X-ray three months before. And I will show you an arrow pointing to this. The renal physician looking after this patient came to the department with the X-ray asking the radiologist, what is this? It's on the three previous films, going back three months, and it hasn't been reported. What is this? So this is an example of a cognitive error, which means that an abnormality was seen, but not recognized, not reported. There was nothing on the patient's chest or his back, so a CT scan was performed. Uh, remember, this was not mentioned for three months and you can clearly see that there is a normality now in the right intermediate bronchus on these two scout views. And this is a foreign body, aspirated dental crown, simply not reported, although it was seen on the chest X-ray. After endoscopic removal, you can see partial re-expansion of the right lower lobe atelectasis. So an unrecognized foreign body, seen but not described, in the right intermediate bronchus, a dental crown, an example of a cognitive error. Now I'll show you a lady of 79 with a chronic cough. This chest X-ray was interpreted as normal by a senior radiologist. You may wonder why this was interpreted as normal. I will show you an enlarged image of this abnormality in the medial mediastinum with a soft tissue opacity with an air crescent. Denis, if you're pointing, thank you very much. This is a double act, so we work together. So there is an air crescent in this uh, middle mediastinum abnormality. Air crescents on chest x-rays are always abnormal, and we'll show you another example later in the presentation. So I've shown you the abnormality. Why was it missed? Well, there may have been poor viewing conditions. Uh, he may have spent too little time looking at the chest X-ray. It's what we call hasty visual tracking. He may have been interrupted by a phone call or a technician. The image quality was perfect, so we can't blame the quality of the film. And we can't blame inexperience because he was a senior radiologist. So what is the question for you? What is your preferred diagnosis? Esophageal stenosis, diverticulum, bezoar, or something else. So please vote now. I'm looking at the number on the right just to see if whether more of you are able to connect your phones. Okay, when we get to 150, I think that's fine to look at the answers, please. Okay, well, those of you who said other, I'm not sure what you would have been thinking about, but this is an esophageal abnormality, and I agree that on the chest X-ray, it's very difficult to distinguish a diverticulum from the uh, bezoar. Maybe some of you perhaps don't know what a bezoar is, and that is retained food material. And uh, this was uh, shown here with the side-by-side -side correlation on the CT, the stippled abnormality within the esophagus, the lateral correlation with the displacement of the air crescent, this was removed endoscopically. There was no uh, diverticulum or other esophageal abnormality, so this was uh, concluded that it was due to a dysmotility uh, abnormality with retained food in the middle esophagus. So the chest X-ray there was interpreted as normal by the radiologist, probably because he was interrupted or just didn't pay enough attention to the uh, interpretation. Now let's look at another film that was also interpreted as normal by the chest x-ray, a 47-year-old man with a chronic cough. Now I guess the radiologist didn't have the clinical symptoms because the pulmonologist did and had the patient in front of him. And when he looked at the chest x-ray, 
he did not interpret this chest X-ray as normal, thankfully for the patient. Now, the question on this case is where is the abnormality located? Right upper lobe, mediastinum, or other? So please vote now. I think we'll have the results when we get to 100, please. Okay. Mediastinum. Well, very well done. Let us go through this together now. There is an abnormality obliterating the retrosternal space on the lateral view. And if I show you the previous patient's chest X-ray and uh, demonstrate the abnormality on the left-hand side in comparison, we have lost the right paratracheal stripe, lost the azygous contour in the right tracheobronchial angle, and that is where the mass is located within the mediastinum. This is the patient's CT scan a couple of weeks later when he has developed stridor, so this is a rapidly growing mass. And on the CT scan, you see the mediastinal mass and lymphadenopathy with this small peripheral pulmonary nodule. This was a case of small cell lung cancer. So missed by the radiologist. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Denis. Thank you very much. One each. Case number seven is an 82-year-old man who has follow-up of renal cell carcinoma. The chest X-ray was considered as normal by six, uh, five out of six radiologists. Here is the chest X-ray. Okay. The question is, is this chest X-ray normal? Yes, no, or you can say. Okay. Let's show the results. It's no, okay, because the session is on mislesions. But who saw the abnormality? Let me show you the same patient two years before. The actual radiograph is 2010 and two years before, 2008. And have a look now on the aortic arch. There is a double contour of the aortic arch, indicating that there is something wrong there. What happened? This patient had a lymphadenopathy next to the aortic arch. Here in axial view, this lesion was almost not detectable on the lateral view. And this is another patient with another example of a mass in this region, but the mass is located in the autopulmonary window, just to show you the difference. The autopulmonary window is bulging. The aortic uh, arch is normal, and the pulmonary artery is somehow obliterated. Here, comparison with CT in six slabs. Here, the axial view of this mass and some coronal views of the aortic arch, the pulmonary artery, and the mass. Remember the autopulmonary window. There is the mass. So a double contour of the aortic arch should be detected and is not normal. Case number eight. It's a 42-year-old woman who had fever and cough, and the chest X-ray was reported as normal. Now, 
now that you are trained, I think you all have recognized this small consolidation in the right lower lobe. We agree with it, it's easy. However, in addition to this right lower lobe pneumonia, what would be your preferred diagnosis? Normal chest X-ray, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, or tuberculosis? Please vote now. Okay, let's show the results. Well done. Indeed, it's sarcoidosis. It is a typical presentation of a sarcoid. Let me show you some details. Here, enlarged right hilum due to lymphadenopathies. The left hilum, the autopulmonary window, we already saw previously the same in mediastinal window. Some additional axial views to show you the autopulmonary window and the enlarged lateral tracheal space, again, also abnormal with lymphadenopathies. And we recognize our right lower lobe pneumonia. On the lateral view, importantly, there is another sign the normal configuration of the posterior wall of the right intermediate bronchus is a thin line that can normally be detected on the chest radiograph here somewhere as a line. In this case, it's no more a line, it's a band with rounded shape because there is a lymphadenopathy posteriorly located to this intermediate bronchus. This location of adenopathies can be detected on the lateral view of the chest radiograph. Sarcoid was confirmed at biopsy. Next case is a 58-year-old woman. Uh, she had a lo upper lobectomy for a carcinoid tumor four years before, and she undergoes control CT. And this is a case of mislesion on CT. Let me show you the axial slices. Okay for everybody? Again? Again. Fantastic enhancement of pulmonary vessels. This is the ATKV acquisition. And here are the summary slides. In three planes. And now the question. What is your diagnosis? No abnormal finding. Pulmonary embolism. Splenosis, tumor recurrence, you can't say. Okay, let's show the results. Good. There is a tumor recurrence. Where is it? There. Hyperdense in the costophrenic angle. Here again. But this lesion is hyperdense. And it's a typical case of lesion you miss because you 
look for another kind of lesion. Usually, tumors are not hyperdense, but hypodense. However, in case of carcinoid tumor, the tumor may be hyperdense and recurrence hyperdense as well. The lesion was detected by the nuclear medicine examination, and there were two locations. This one I showed you, and we see a follow-up CT with an increase in size of the lesion. And the second lesion was located next to the pericardium, also missed, and did also increase in size, detected by the nuclear medicine examination. So undetected tumor, tumor recurrence in the right costophrenic angle and the pericardium. And now up to Nigel. Okay, well, I'll show you number nine now. We are a third of the way through the session. We're keeping to time. And I'd like to thank the room technician already because this is going very smoothly and uh, we're very happy with that. Thank you. Now, I'll show you a 40-year-old man. He is a nurse in the operating room and he's a smoker. In 2004, he had a pre-employment chest X-ray. And in 2005, he developed a cough. This is the 2004 chest X-ray. This is the 2005 chest X-ray. And I will show them side by side. If you have a PAX, I recommend that you look at the previous films. If you don't look at the previous films, somebody else will later. And this is what happened in this particular case. Because these two radiographs were interpreted as normal. And this is the following year. The patient is now short of breath. His heart is enlarged and he has developed signs of what we'll see are lymphangitis in the right chest with a pleural effusion. Now the question is, when did the patient die? This is a test of your optimism in medical uh, science and treatment. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2011, or if you're very optimistic, is the patient still alive? So please vote now. And we don't need to spend too much time waiting for the answers. Okay, we can have the answers, please. I'm happy to see the answers. Well, some of you are optimistic. Nearly 33%. Okay, I'd like to be looked after you if this happens to me. Anyway, sadly, the patient died a year later. The... Um, CT scan performed in 2006 shows the mass in the right upper lobe above the hilum with a pleural effusion and signs of lymphangitis with some septal thickening. If we look back at the 2005 x-ray, and this of course was done, while well, the mass could be seen above the hilum on that film a year before. I'm sure Denis is helping me here. Thank you. So, uh, this was a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. The patient had chemotherapy. He died in January 2007. The patient and the family, because he had time to find his previous films, they filed a malpractice lawsuit against the pulmonologist, the radiologist, and the hospital for missing the lesion on the 2005 film. And this comes from Belgium, not from Switzerland, so there's a much greater backlog of uh, lawsuits in the judicial system in Belgium, so this has not yet come to trial. Now, 70-year-old man, dyspnea, cough, and a prior history of prostate cancer. Here is his chest x-ray. You've been trained on 10 cases already this afternoon, so where is the lesion? The right hilum the left hilum, the mediastinum, 
or is there more than one lesion? So please vote now, and anyone who says more than one lesion has to be prepared to come onto the podium and show us where those lesions are. But we won't do that, don't worry. I can go back and show you the film enlarged if you like. So right hilum, left hilum, mediastinum, or more than one lesion. So let us see the results, please. Okay, more than one lesion. So I hope some of you are prepared to come and show these lesions or to us. Of course, there is more than one lesion. This is all about missed lesions. We've talked quite a bit so far about the hilum. So this is a key area to look at and concentrate upon in the chest. And there is this abnormal contour, which I'm sure most of you saw, I hope at least, with a lymphadenopathy in the right hilum. But what else on the chest X-ray? How many of you picked up this abnormality? On the lateral view, there should be no soft tissue opacity projected over the column of air in the trachea. So this is an abnormal contour. And if you identify this, if you do look carefully at the natural film, then you have to find it on the frontal view. And the frontal view, there is an abnormal contour of the mediastinum here in the area of the tracheobronchial angle or maybe paraspinal. It's very difficult to locate exactly whether this is in front or in the middle or in the back on the chest X-ray. On the CT scan, this is a necrotic lymph node behind the trachea, which is bulging into the posterior wall of the trachea, which explains the abnormality on the lateral view of the chest X-ray. And here you have the correlation with the CT scan in the sagittal plane to understand that abnormality better. And the explanation for the abnormality on the frontal view is that the azygous vein is displaced laterally by this enlarged necrotic lymph node. So this is to tell you about the SOS syndrome, satisfaction of search. Remember, George, because how many of you saw this lesion? A lytic metastasis in the rib on the anterior chest wall. So three potentially missed lesions, one obvious in the hilum, which I hope most of you uh, with the training you've already had this afternoon picked up, one difficult in the mediastinum, and one very difficult, the rib metastasis. So beware of the satisfaction of search syndrome, and remember George. Now we have a 53-year-old man who's a smoker, and this is a preoperative chest X-ray for a cataract. So we're talking about missed lesions in the chest. And I now hopefully think that you will have seen this. And where is it on the lateral view? Well, it's in the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. But the question is, what other diagnosis do you suggest? A ruptured diaphragm? An empyema? a malignant pleural effusion, a lung abscess, or none of the above. So I've talked about cognitive errors this afternoon. Please vote now. This is a perceptual error in that this abnormality was obviously seen, but not correctly interpreted because the information was lacking. So please vote now. multiple air fluid levels in the left chest and the node in the left, sorry, the nodule in the left upper lobe which was picked up. So let's have the uh, answers, please. Well, we have a very wide spread. The radiologist interpreting this chest x-ray was very worried that this patient had an empyema, but the patient had left the department uh, after the chest x-ray was performed. This was uh, preoperative for a cataract, so the patient was absolutely fine. And he told the technician, 
don't worry, I know I have an abnormality in the left chest. I've been told this for many years. It's nothing to worry about, so don't bother me with that. I'm going home. The radiologist was not convinced. Um, of course, organized a CT scan, not because of the clinical history, but because of the node in the um, the nodule, I'm sorry, in the left upper lobe, which was the correct way to proceed. And on the CT scan, well, the nodule is confirmed. And the explanation for what was uh, thought to be a possible empyema because of those multiple fluid levels was, in fact, as follows. The air is in the stomach and the colon, and there is no diaphragm and no left low lobe. This is a congenital abnormality. The uh, peritoneal structures are in the hemithorax. This was congenital left low lobe agenesis with a pleurodiaphragmatic malformation which was mimicking an empyema. The patient had a T1 left upper lobe lung cancer which was picked up on the chest x-ray and correctly treated. So thank you and over to Denis. Case number 13 is a 74-year-old man with exacerbation of chronic airway disease. The chest radiograph is reported as normal. On this chest radiograph, there is evidence of lung cancer. And you can stage it. So the question is, what is the stage of the lung cancer? One, two, three, or four? Please vote now. Okay. Let's show the results. It's a stage three. Aha. Uh -huh. The next day, the patient was very ill. He received this bedside chest radiograph. And because the pneumologist thought that it, there was an enlargement of the right upper mediastinum, he requested a CT. For your information, the right upper mediastinum is normal. But the trachea is displayed to the right. This displacement is due to a mass in the neck which proved to be a nodal metastasis from a cancer. Well, where is this cancer? Have a close look on the lateral view. We have shown you a case previously with an air crescent. Air crescent are, are not normal in the chest. And in here we do have an air crescent. And the question would be, where is this lesion? In the right? or in the left stem bronchus. Okay, let's go to details. This is another patient, and this is this line I described previously, the posterior wall of the right intermediate bronchus, here in sagittal plane. This line can be seen in more than 70% of patients. Here another correlation in a normal patient. In our patient, we do have this line. So, the right bronchus tree should be normal, and the lesion located in the left main stem bronchus. And if we have now a close look to the frontal view, we can see this iceberg lesion in the left main stem bronchus. So, this is a nodal metastasis in the base of the neck, and 3 so it's a stage 3B lung cancer. 
Next patient is a 60-year-old woman. She has a preoperative routine chest radiograph. Here is the examination. Of course, remember George. And now the question, where is the second lesion? Right upper lobe, left upper lobe, right lower lobe, left lower lobe, or none of the above? Please vote now. Okay, let's look at the results. Let me show you. There is a second lesion, and the lesion is not in the lungs. Of course, the CT was performed because of the nodule. And on the CT, a second lesion was missed as well, and this lesion is in the trachea, not detected on the CT, but detected at endoscopy. Almost not detectable on the frontal view, this lesion was biopsied and was a squamous cell carcinoma of the trachea. The nodule was the unique PET active Lesion was also biopsied and it was a metastasis. And the patient had a complete response of the, to, to therapy the year later, the year after, for the squamous cell carcinoma of the trachea with one metastasis in the left lower lobe. Case number 15. It's a 59 year old man with chest pain. He has an intermediate risk factor for coronary artery disease, inconclusive stress tests, and is, he is referred for a chest radiograph and a coronary CTA. Here is the chest radiograph. Where is the lesion? Right apex, left apex, right hilum, left hilum, or none of the above? Please vote now. Okay, let's look at the results. Left hilum, very good. Coronary CTA detected the lesion that was not seen and reported on the chest radiograph. Here is it, it's three centimeter large, but no clear contour with the lung and difficult to detect within the left hilum. Here are some correlations with thick slab. So detected at coronary CTA. Nigel. So we just did a quick uh, time check. Uh, we're halfway through the session, but as you get better, the rate at which we're going to show you the cases is going to accelerate. 
So we will get through the 33 cases, although we're halfway through the time now. Now this case is courtesy of our colleague, Professor Jevenois in Brussels. A 63-year-old woman with a prior history of breast cancer and of poorly differentiated gastrointestinal stromal tumor in the right iliac fossa. She had chest X-ray follow-ups for her breast cancer in 1999, in 2000, and in 2001. This is the 1999 chest X-ray reported as normal. This is the 2000 chest X-ray reported by the same radiologist comparing the film with the previous one. This was in the report, reported as normal. And this is the 2001 chest X-ray, again reported by the same radiologist comparing the chest X-ray to the previous film and reporting it again as normal. Well, the patient developed hemoptysis. I will show you the three films again. And what we're illustrating here is what we call a spine sign with an opacity which appears over the vertebral body, in the mid-region of the chest here, posteriorly, and increases in size. So, because of the hemoptysis, the CT scan was performed and this lesion was then found. It was operated. She had surgery for this left lower lobe tumor, and soon after she developed a spinal metastasis, paraplegia, and died one month later. The family filed a malpractice lawsuit against the radiologist when the films were found from the archive and reviewed, and it was clearly seen that that opacity was visible on at least two of the previous three years. The case went to trial, and now we have the question for you on this case. This is to test again whether you commiserate with your radiologist's difficulty with interpreting the films, or if you're tough and you think that he should be punished. So, was the radiologist found guilty, yes or no? Please vote now. Now, this could be you, it could be one of your colleagues. Think about that when you vote. In which country? Good question. In Belgium. The cases are from Switzerland and from Belgium. About 50-50. So let's have the um, result, please. Okay. Now, a majority of you are in favor of uh, letting the radiologist off, which is kind. The decision of the court was that the radiologist was not guilty, and the reasoning they gave was as follows. First of all, there was no reason to do a chest X-ray in this patient because there's no recommendation from any community in the oncological uh, societies to perform an annual chest X-ray on a patient with breast cancer. So the test was not indicated. Then, missing a lesion, as we've seen this afternoon, on a chest X-ray is frequent. And there was no biopsy of the spinal metastasis, so there was no way of proving that it was the lesion in the lung, the lung cancer, which caused the metastasis and not one of the other two tumors of the patient. So the patient, the radiologist, was found not guilty. Number 17 now. We have a 78-year-old woman with severe chronic cardiac failure. She was admitted to the intensive care unit of the cardiology department with this chest X-ray. Now, we've shown you over the last 45 minutes quite a few difficult lesions to pick up in the region of the hilum and the mediastinum. This is her chest X-ray two months later. She's better, and she's gone home after treatment for her cardiac insufficiency. I'll put the two x-rays side by side, two months apart, these two x-rays. 
and we would like to ask you the following question. Where has the patient developed pain? The answer is on the film. The right lung base, the right shoulder, the retrosternal region, or below the diaphragm in the abdomen. Please vote now. Show you the films with the large size. Two months between these two x-rays. Where has the patient developed pain? Okay, thank you. Please show the answers. Well, congratulations for those who answered B. That is the correct answer. What was not seen on this, these two x-rays is this very large apical tumor on the right, a pancose tumor. So we've talked about the hilum. The other difficult area to be careful with are the apices. Compare the radiotransparency of the two apices here there is this large necrotic tumor, and this was a pancose tumor, non-small cell lung cancer. No treatment was proposed because of her age and heart failure, and the patient died at home comfortably three weeks after having been discharged. So remember to look at the apices. This is a very quick case now, 35-year-old woman. The prior history is not known. You don't need your smartphones for this one. The question is, where is the left first rib? So whether any of you saw this, now that you're concentrating on the apex, this was a previously resected left first rib. Remember to look at the apices and compare the density in that region. So thank you. Over to Denis, and you'll see now that the cases will uh, be shown to you at a faster rate. Okay, case 19, it's a 79-year-old woman. She complains of fatigue, weight loss, polyarticular pain. And the chest radiograph is requested by the rheumatologist and reported as normal. Where do you think is the missed lung lesion? Right upper lobe, left upper lobe, right lower lobe left lower lobe. Please vote now. Okay, can we see the results? You voted left lower lobe, very good. Indeed. The next day she had hemoptysis and a CT was performed. And the CT showed this lesion that was not reported. What do we see? On the lateral view, an opacity can be seen that is too large to correspond to the pulmonary artery and that is distinct from the descending aorta that we can recognize thanks to the calcifications. So this, leads, this opacity is in addition to normal structures and on the frontal view there is an interruption of the left para-aortic para line. In this case, the radiologist was saved by the patient's symptoms and there was no lawsuit. 85-year-old man with cough. Do you think there is a lung cancer in this patient? Indeed, we see an opacity. On the lateral view, clearly, 
rounded, very regular. But it's an horizontal lower aortic thoracic uh, position. It's mimicking a nodule or a mass, but it's not. So beware of false positive and remember in old patients, aorta can be horizontal. Case 21. This is a 79-year-old man, COPD, severe. He complains of chest pain, exacerbation of dyspnea. He's got a chest radiograph, and thereafter he is treated with antibiotics. And the question is, would you recommend or give antibiotics? Yes, no, don't know. Please vote now. Okay, can we see the results? The answer is no. These opacities represent massive pulmonary fibrosis in a silicotic patient, and antibiotics are not uh, efficient to cure these lesions. But what the emergency uh, clinician should have looked at is this thin line representing a visceral pleura and indicating a pneumothorax. In addition, there is another sign, an indirect sign of pneumothorax. There is a hyperlucency here and a caudal displacement of the diaphragm. The caudal displacement of the diaphragm here in another patient is named the deep sulcus sign in a patient lying. This sign is indicative of a massive pneumothorax. So remember these signs to detect pneumothoraces in bedside chest radiographs. Now we're going to move on to a different pathology. We have a 68-year-old woman at the emergency department. She comes with a cough and a fever, and the receiving emergency doctor is uh, convinced that there is a uh, clinical suspicion of pneumonia. He's found signs with the stethoscope. And this is the patient's chest X-ray. I'm going to ask you the following question. In which lobe is the consolidation? So we have a clinical suspicion of pneumonia with the appropriate history, clinical setting, and clinical signs, according to the emergency doctor. So we're looking for signs of pneumonia on the chest x-ray now. Right upper lobe, left upper lobe, right lower lobe left low lobe, or there is no consolidation. And of course, you're perfectly entitled to reply that this x-ray is normal if you think so. So please vote now. We're looking for radiological signs of pneumonia. Thank you. We can have the uh, results, please. There is no consolidation. Well, I would agree with those of you who answered that. This X-ray was reported as normal. The emergency doctor was quite um, 
faced with the problem because he was pretty sure clinically that she had pneumonia. He did a battery of tests, and unfortunately, he uh, did the D-dimers that came back at just over 500. So he felt obliged to carry out a CT scan, which he did. And the CT scan revealed this consolidation in the anterior segment of the left lower lobe, which retrospectively, you might agree, but you are allowed to disagree, you could see here behind the heart on the frontal view is a faint increased density, and it's overlapping the heart on the lateral view. Now, pneumonia can be difficult to detect on the chest X-ray. I'm not suggesting that we should use a CT scan to detect pneumonia, but the point of this case is to show you another difficult area on the chest X-ray, and we're going to concentrate on that on a few cases now, and that is behind the heart. So we've looked at the hyla, we've looked at the apices, and concentrate also on looking behind the heart. So clinically evident pneumonia can be very difficult to detect on a chest X-ray. Now, the 77-year-old man also has cough and fever. Here is the chest X-ray with an abnormality picked up on the lateral view here. Not so easy to figure out exactly where that's located on the frontal view. So with a cough and a fever and this chest X-ray, the patient received antibiotics. He then had a follow-up because he was a smoker, and uh, on the follow-up chest X-ray, well, there was no change. So a CT scan was requested. Left low lobe pneumonia. Would you have treated this patient? No improvement after the antibiotics. The CT was requested. And here we have the explanation for this abnormality. This is of fatty density. It is a Bochtelic hernia posteriorly at the left base. The correlation here with the CT scan and on the frontal view you can see the hernia through the diaphragm with this fatty tissue which you can just about see on the frontal view but it was obvious on the lateral. So This was an example of a Bochtelic hernia treated as a left lower lobe pneumonia. So please beware of false positives. Now another man with a cough, 55-year-old. Let us look at this chest X-ray. Does the chest X-ray help explain the patient's symptoms? How would you report this film? Is the chest X-ray normal? Yes, no, can't say. After an hour with us, you're no longer allowed to answer can't say. So yes or no, normal, abnormal. Please vote now. Normal or abnormal? So let us look at the answers, please. Well, that's a perfect split. This means this is really working well, so I'm very happy. For those of you who, of course, said that the chest X-ray was abnormal, you'd have to come and tell me how you'd describe it and what was abnormal. Um, it's very subtle on this chest X-ray, so we would have accepted a can't say, in fact. There is diffuse ground glass on this chest X-ray. It's very difficult to pick up. The previous generation of radiologists who were working on films that were not digital were very good at picking up ground glass, especially before CT scan arrived. Now with interstitial lung disease, we look at all this with the CT scans. We forgot how to look at the chest X-ray, and particularly in terms of picking up ground glass. But it is very difficult on a digital film, particularly on a a screen, on a, on, on a computer screen, especially with uh, too much light. But on the CT scan, there is diffuse, patchy ground glass opacity. This patient underwent a lavage. A diagnosis was established on that basis. Here you have the correlation with the frontal view. Interstitial lung disease can be invisible on a chest X-ray. On 
anything between 10 and 20% of patients which then have biopsy-proven interstitial lung disease in the follow-up. So it's not unusual to, be, to, to, to miss this abnormality. After three weeks of steroids, everything disappeared. This was an example of extrinsic allergic alveolitis, almost impossible to pick up on the chest X-ray with a predominant ground glass pattern at CT. So we just had to put one interstitial lung disease in our talk this afternoon, and that is that case, almost undetectable. Over to Denis. Case number 25 is a 60-year-old woman, dyspnea and chest pain. And she comes to the emergency room and has a chest radiograph. I don't show you the lateral because not relevant. Based on this radiograph, what would you propose? Heart failure, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, or normal? Please vote now. There is a lot of hesitation. Okay, let's display the results. A majority of you voted for pulmonary embolism, and this is correct. What do we see? First, we see an enlargement of the right pulmonary artery. This is name, named the Fleischner sign. Second, we see oligemia in peripheral vessels. This is the Westermark sign. And third, we see a rounded aspect of the right pulmonary artery named the knuckle sign. These three signs are not sensitive but highly specific of massive central pulmonary embolism without infarction. Here we see the correlation. Of course, there is a differential diagnosis, chronic PE, or pulmonary hypertension without pulmonary embolism. Not sensitive, but highly specific signs that we can see on chest radiograph indicating massive PE. Case number 26. This is a 77-year-old woman with dyspnea, and she is, she is referred for a CT pulmonary angiography to rule out PE. And the on-call radiologist reported the CTPA as negative. This is the topogram of the examination. And let's go now through the axial slices. It's clear for everybody. Ah, again. And again. Last time. Well, what is your diagnosis? Negative for PE. Aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, or other? Please vote now.
Okay. Can we have the results? Okay. There is something else. Very good. Here we have the key images. We don't see pulmonary emboli. What we see is first a narrowing of the right pulmonary artery. And second, where is the superior vena cava? Here. And what's that? What's that? There are signs of right heart failure. And the day after we performed a second examination with a delayed phase, and we can see an enhancement of this mass within the pericardium and the heart. This proved to be a pericardial lymphoma, not detected on the CTPA examination. So look for other abnormal findings when you have to rule out PE. This is a well-known uh, context. Case number 27. It's a 64-year-old man with prior history of pneumoconiosis, silicosis, and maltoma. Maltoma is a lymphoma in the mucosal structures of the stomach. Follow-up CT are performed and considered as negative for tumor recurrence over four years. So we have here in this patient an axial slice showing lymphadenopathies, maybe due to silicosis. Reformats show you nodules and micronodules in the apices, could be silicosis. Here, some axial slices. So the question to you, based on these findings, is what do you report? Silicosis without lymphoma? Silicosis with evidence of lymphoma? Silicosis with carcinoma? Lymphoma? Or you can say, please vote now. Okay, can we have the results? Silicosis with carcinoma is the best answer. One year later, the patient developed brain metastasis and he had a new chest CT. What do we see? This nodule increased in size and was biopsied and proved to be a carcinoma. However, this nodule had been considered as a lesion compatible with silicosis, whereas it's very different from all other micronodules in the same patient. This lesion had not been measured and described. Here in coronal views. So, Beware, lesions that does not fit, do not fit with usual findings of interstitial lung disease. Carcinoma may appear uh, in a patient with infiltrative lung disease as well. Okay, at this stage, uh, I give you a five-second break just to thank... Uh my friend and colleague Denis, because we're keeping perfectly on time, and uh, we'll show you the last six cases in the last 15 minutes. Now, so thank you, Denis. Okay, 63-year-old woman now, severe COPD and shortness of breath. Don't worry too much 
about the calcified granuloma. And don't worry too much about all the signs of COPD. Look at these chest radiographs and answer the following question. What is your diagnosis? Active tuberculosis, a right hyla mass, left lower lobe collapse, or can't say? And I think you definitely can't say, can't say. So please vote now. Active tuberculosis, right hyla mass, left lower lobe collapse, or can't say. There are many abnormalities on these two films, and I'm going to take, them, take you through them. The most important abnormality was not seen. So please let us see the results. Oh, very good. Congratulations for those of you who saw and identified correctly left low lobe collapse, which is the correct answer. Now, what do we see on these films? Well, there is a difference in density of the lung bases. This is hyperlucent compared with the right base. There is an increased retrosternal space, which we have to explain. And then there's an abnormal contour of the diaphragm, which is raised here. And this is the left hemidiaphragm with the gastric air bubble below the left hemidiaphragm. But the most important sign is the asymmetry of the size of the hyla. You could ask yourself, is this enlarged? Or has this side disappeared? And if you integrate the hyperlucency here with the lost hilum, you should be able to conclude correctly that this is complete collapse of the left lower lobe. This is the most frequently missed atelectasis. And again, it's this difficult area behind the heart. On the CT scan, you understand the herniation here of the right lung, which explains that uh, hyperlucency in the retrosternal area on the lateral view. This is hyperinflation of the left upper lobe and complete atelectasis of the left lower lobe. Left lower lobe collapse, a little message for you here, chronic lower lobe collapse may present without a mass or consolidation. Now we have a 56-year-old man with left-sided chest pain, and this is his chest x-ray one week after a motor vehicle accident. There is an abnormality which is obvious on the chest x-ray. But what is your diagnosis? Lung abscess, pneumatocele, right hyla mass, or more than one diagnosis? So this is one week after a motor vehicle accident. Please vote now. Lung abscess, pneumatocele, right hyla mass, or more than one diagnosis. Here we could see the results, please. Very good. And I would like to be able to ask you individually what you saw, but we can't do that here this afternoon with the numbers present, but the answer is more than one diagnosis. And what we're trying to show you with this case is right lower lobe collapse, which is identified on the CT scan, which was performed because of the... Uh, pneumatocele, or the cavity anyway, with the uh, air fluid level seen on the chest x-ray. But there is displacement of the major fissure, and these signs can be seen on the film, which was uh, not reported. So this straight line here, the loss of the right heart border, and on the lateral view, a very important sign, there is only one Hemidiaphragm. There should always be two hemidiaphragms on the lateral view if 
one is missing, then you try to work out which one is missing. On this side, you have this is the left, distinct from the pneumatoseal here. And on the right-hand side, due to the consolidation, the hemidiaphragm is lost. So left pneumatoseal, but remember, George, and don't miss the right lower lobe collapse. 72-year-old woman with a chest x-ray after insertion of a pacemaker. The following day, she has chest pain. This is the chest x-ray on day one. All is well after the pacemaker insertion. And this is day two, and she now has chest pain. And we didn't find an explanation for her chest pain on these radiographs. But what is your diagnosis? Pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, heart failure, or other? The answer is on the film. Day one, no symptoms. Day two, chest pain. Please vote now. Okay, we'll have the answers because uh, we would like to finish exactly on time. Please show us the answers. Okay, other. Very good. And now I hope what you have noted is the position of the wire. So be careful to look at the wire and you will see that it has moved. If you don't look at the wire, you will not pick up this change. It has moved laterally and anteriorly, and because this was not seen and the patient had symptoms where well, we asked for a CT scan, and this shows that the wire has gone through the myocardium, through the pericardium, to the chest wall, and its tip is against the chondrocostal junction. That's why she has pain. The wire was removed and replaced by the cardiologist with no adverse consequences to the patient, fortunately perforated right ventricle by the pacemaker wire. So remember to look at the wires. And I'll go quickly through a couple of cases to finish. Sometimes the patient helps you. Where is the heart on this chest x-ray? Well, it was on the patient's T-shirt. Okay, so this is the last case I will show you. I'm going to show you quite quickly because please don't leave the room. The next and two last cases which Denis will show you are spectacular. So they're really worth waiting for. And if we go over time in just a minute or two, please... Forgive us. 58-year-old woman now with a chest X-ray for a, with a follow-up for colon cancer. She has abnormal liver function tests. And we're looking at foreign bodies in the chest. Where is this portacat device? In the superior vena cava, in the right atrium, in the right ventricle, the inferior vena cava, or none of the above? So I'll show you the films again. Please vote now to tell us where you think the catheter from the Porthacat device is situated. So you can show me the answers. This isn't very uh, important at this stage. In fear of vena cava, well, if you look at the x-ray carefully, it's a little bit further down. It's in the midline, which is good, but it has moved anteriorly below the diaphragm. So below the diaphragm is not good, and anteriorly is even worse. And where is this situated? Well, it's in the middle suprahepatic vein with thrombosis around the tip of the catheter. So a thrombosed middle suprahepatic vein from a misplaced PAC device. Remember to look at the wires and the tubes on a chest X-ray. So thank you, and I will hand over for Denis for the last two cases and the concluding slides. Thank you. Nigel, it's been a privilege to prepare these and share these cases with you. It's a 63-year-old man. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. He comes in the emergency room with dyspnea, and arrhythmia. This is a medical legal case. A bedside chest radiograph is obtained. And we go immediately to the question. Up to you. What is the likelihood 
that this large left opacity is due to a large pleural effusion. Less than 10%, 30%, 50%, more than 90%, or you can't say. Please vote now. This radiograph was not interpreted by a radiologist until the next morning. Can we see the results? Good. Less than 10%. First, we do see the descending aorta. This means that there is air posteriorly in the left lower lobe. We do not see the heart, the left border of the heart. The opacity is anterior. Finally, the mediastinum is not displayed. St. So we have a silhouette sign on the heart and the left hilum, no displacement, and we do see the descending aorta. There is no place for a large pleural effusion. If we had a large pleural effusion, the descending aorta, as in this case, another case, would be obliterated. This was not correctly analyzed. A left chest drain was inserted. The emergency a uh, physician had fresh blood coming out of the drain. He then requested a CT, but prior to the CT, removed the drain. Here now we have an effusion with blood, and we have a mass and a uh, collapse of the left upper lobe and a pneumothorax. But what we do also see is a large hematoma between the pancreas and the spleen. And the next day, the patient died. So this is a death from a pancreatic and splenic injury caused by a chest drain inserted without imaging guidance. Malpractice from A to Z. Last case, 87-year-old woman with fever and an inflammatory syndrome. Here are the frontal and lateral chest radiographs. And this is your last vote. What is your diagnosis? Diverticulitis? infiltrative lung disease, left lower lobe pneumonia, or other. Please vote now. Okay, can we see the results? The correct answer is acute diverticulitis. What do we see? We see a pneumomediastinum and air below the diaphragm in the retroperitoneum, explaining all these irregular lucencies. Pneumomediastinum and retropneumoperitoneum are indicative of perforated left colon diverticulitis, which was the case here. So look also below the diaphragm. 
mankind is plagued by four main diseases, heart failure, infectious disease, pulmonary neoplasms, chronic obstructive airway diseases. They can all be detected accurately on standard radiographs, provided the reader has received the appropriate radiology training. Even a slight improvement can provide huge benefits in terms of time, cost, and health to our patients. Beware, one trap may conceal another. We hope that we will have helped you to decrease your error rate. Good luck and thank you. Thanks. Thank you.